Hey folks, um, I'm going to do a geometric dimension intolerancing, um, actually fairly quickly. Um, so a geometric dimension intolerancing came about um, because it began to be understood that the basic Cartesian dimensional controls um, were not fully fulfilling the actualization of engineering parts. Um, but a little more lightly, if you look at this picture here right at the beginning, which is uh, from a really great kid's book about making a steam locomotive uh, called Superpower, um, this beautiful pen and ink drawing of two uh, draftsmen working on this locomotive, you can see that there's this square down here on the edge of the board, and that would slide along and automatically give them a, a normal line to the top. And they would take this sheet of paper and pin it down on these four point corners to square it up. And then they can move and extend this lines, these lines uh, square and parallel throughout the whole sheet. Let me jump back to the show and tell. Um, behind you, you can see I have got a drafting table of sort of intermediate technology. There's a parallelogram arm on there and a little square. Um, and I can move square lines anywhere around on the sheet of paper. It's a fun way to work um, before CAD and CAM. Um, moving geometry and keeping it consistent and square with itself um, was a challenge that uh, was addressed with these uh, mechanical and technical assistance. Um, but going into geometric and dimensioning and tolerancing, um, it's a system for communicating what you need a product to do to a manufacturer in a way that doesn't require English or any other notes or special design. So it's a symbolic language, it's an international symbolic language that's organized with an international standard. Um, and it should be able to communicate any geometrical shape, any arbitrary geometrical shape that has to be assembled with another one and communicate the assembly requirements completely unto itself. Um, and it sort of follows that it's a parametric description language, much like your modern CAD setup, um, where if you go in and master the CAD's language and the way it wants to hear and, and interact and present parameters for straightness and for fillets and radiuses and how fits are and surfaces and blends and all of, all of the details, if you master all of that, you can render any arbitrary shape. Um, the same with uh, geometric dimension and tolerancing, you can accurately describe a shape using only these symbols. Um, so related to the drafting at the beginning, we used to use what is now referred to as Cartesian dimension and tolerancing, where you say such and such feature is on an XY plane and it is here. And it can be here within a tolerance of plus or minus five inches. Um, it seems like that should be all you really need to know. Here's the feature, here's where it is in space, and here's how much it can move around. As it turns out, this is a Cartesian dimension and tolerancing. As it turns out, the errors kind of stack up and don't self-describe the reality. Um, so I've got a simple plate here. I want four holes in it. Um, and you know, hole one is at one, one. Hole four over here is at three, three. Now, I've given my manufacturer five thousandths, but if they start in this corner, this hole's tolerance is now much lower, right? Because um, I have to pass bolts through this is the reality, right? Or some other thing has to go through this. It has to relate to this assembly. Um, so I need to close down the tolerance if I have a tolerance on the hole. Here's an illustration of that a little more carefully described. Um, so the original center here is our 5,000th tolerance zone, or let's see if this is this scale. Yeah, I think so. And then this is our larger tolerance zone here. If we were to use a ge geometric dimensioning call out, um, and we say the hole has to be at this X, Y point, but it can deviate circularly rather than squarely in X and Y. So we get all of this extra space. Um, and the reason this makes additional sense is it's much easier if you imagine me trying to post a bolt through this uh, and through a large pattern of these, if I have this circular extra space out here, it's much easier for me to get that bolt through after I put the sixth or seventh or eighth or fiftieth bolt 
in that pattern. The tolerance kind of stays near its maximum best condition. Um, GDT is uh, controlled uh, by this standard, uh, ASME Y14.5M, and it's revised every couple of years. I believe there's a 2020 or 2021 expected. Uh, there's, it tracks with an ISO standard, uh, so they run in, in parallel lockstep, so they come out at the same time, and they're overseen by the same, functionally the same board uh, that gathers feedback from industry and makes revisions and has a careful deliberation process that's pretty well documented. It's neat to read the language. The language of the standard is in plain English. It's hard, it takes concentration, but it is fundamentally in plain English. It's well worth, and I think we have references here at the end, uh, for getting a book on how to work and work with this stuff. Uh, it can control form, profile, orientation, location, and run out. Uh, run out in this last one is, is unique to cylindrical uh, surfaces. Uh, the rest uh, can, can be on all kinds of shapes and so forth. Um, here's uh, the symbols for some of the callouts. Um, uh, the names uh, very specific geometric forms as subsets. Um, so in form, we can control how straight, flat, circular, or cyl cylindrical something is, etc., etc. Uh, here is a GD&T print, very basic gd and print. It's a circular disc, a flange of something. Maybe it's a pipe flange. Um, it has four holes on the outside, one hole on the center. It has a datum reference here, A, so it wants this to be measured first with this set down on a flat surface. Uh, and then B is the circle, the outside circle itself. So it wants to be this diameter. So here's our first actual GD&T control frame. Um, this diameter needs to be square within 30 thousandths at its largest size, maximum material condition, to A. All right, so what we're saying is this angle here needs to be square and the top of this can't move left or right more than 30 thousandths if it's full size. If it's less it can move up to that. Um, we have a similar call, well we have a call out for a hole position in the center. It's a pretty generous call out. Uh, it can be anywhere between six tenths of an inch and an inch. Uh, although units aren't stated on this so this could be millimeters but this would be a fabulously small precise some sort of watch part or uh, precision uh, microelectronics manufacturing part or something uh, if it were in millimeters. Um, so we'll presume it's inches right now, but it's always worth checking. Um, so now we're calling this position out um, yeah, for diameter in relation to A and B. And then we have uh, four holes uh, with a little bit of space. Uh, and this is essentially a classic bolt hole circle call out. Um, and these are wanted to be have a pretty close control position relative to the bolt circle is what the engineer is telling us because they set this center hole as D. So inspection process, we'd lay this down flat. We would make sure this would square. We would then check that this was normal to the center, right? It was centered within this tolerance. And then we would check that these four, right, are in a positional relationship with respect to the center circle. And we're not so concerned. We are somewhat concerned Right, but the, the tolerance and the information that the engineer is trying to convey is that we want these four holes close to that center. This is a basic dimension. Uh, so this is our fall through. If we are not controlling it geometrically, this falls back to a Cartesian basic call out. Um, here's an illustration that's a little complex. Um, you can sort through it a bit if you like um, offline. Uh, but this is related to the earlier thing where we have the circular tolerance zone instead of the square tolerance zone. So if this outer thing is the actual drilled hole, right, and my true position wanted to be, or my, my manufactured position wanted to be here, um, and the tolerance is this, and this is where the hole actually ended up, we can see that it'll still make it because of MMC, maximum material condition. The hole is as big as it can be. Um, so the, the bolt that we're trying to post through this thing will actually fit. Um, so this is where a square tolerance zone would have failed. This part would have gotten rejected. 
but because we're calling out this maximum material conditioning, forcing it into circularity relative to a position, uh, we get a lot of extra room. Um, here's a part I did at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. There's some of my handwritten notes on it. Um, you can see it's, I'm just getting that, I know I need that number for machining later. They wanted me to pretty religiously make sure that if I Xeroxed or made a new print of something that it was a copy, that the original document was genuine. Um, so the engineer here is working on, I think this is, yeah, this is the advanced light source, which is a kind of an x-ray laser uh, type facility up there. They're telling me the top feature frame here, A, wants to be flat within a thousandths. So that gets my attention right away as a machinist. That needs to be flat, okay? And this surface here, which is islanded in, it's a subsurface, wants to be f parallel to this surface within a thousandths. So the engineer is straight away saying, this is what matters, this island in here and this top surface, and they need to be flat and parallel within a thousandth of an inch to each other. And then they, after giving me all that bad news, give me a whole bunch of good news here, right, is my tolerances for width are pretty easy, squareness is pretty easy, this hole has got lots of room, they don't really care. Um, well, they, you know, they do care because they've got to bolt it down and there's a into another object, so this has to be the right size, but they've given me plenty of room. But what they really want is this flat and this parallel to it, which makes it also flat within a pretty tight tolerance. So this is an example here of controlling parallelism. Uh, there's quite a deep deck here, so I'm not going to go into all these verbally um, and you know sort of read them off or anything. This is a pretty good example though, so we'll go in a little more on this one, uh, but the others we're gonna kind of jump through and you can look through afterwards. Uh, there'll be some practice ones where you can look up. And once again, this is a topic well worth diving into a little bit uh, on your own initiative, just starting to get some familiarity uh, with it. Um, I took a full semester course on this and then another 12 week um, web-based extension course on it uh, many years ago now. Um, but uh, it's a complex topic when you really start to unpack it. Um, so the datum here is A. Um, so this is the bottom. This is presumably a lining bracket for a pair of rotating shafts, like this is keeping a pair of um, crankshafts or a crankshaft and a drive shaft or something like that in alignment for power transmission purposes, just as a guess looking at it. Once again, though, the point here is that this symbolic language means you don't have to tell them, um, although it's always helpful to. Uh, but that anybody should be able to manufacture it um, in any shop in the world um, if they can understand the symbolic language of GD&T. Um, so they're saying that this is to be this size, uh, 10, we'll presume this is millimeters, can't be less than 10, um, can be up to 10.022. So it's a 220 micron tolerance is kind of kind of tight, but it gets even tighter here. The, the bore here, right, has to be parallel to the bore of A within 50 microns at its largest size. So if it's less, um, you know, if it's 10.01, it has to be parallel within 40 microns. And if it's all the way down at the bottom, 10.002, it's gotta be parallel within 32 microns, 0.032 of A. And what the engineer here is saying is, these two have to be parallel. If it's off parallelism, uh, and a smaller size, that's okay, but it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. So the manufacturer would drive towards the top to give them more space. This is sort of a classic uh, GD&T uh, example print. This is like on the cover of the main handbook guide that I think is referenced at the end. Um, but so the first thing you always do is look for the datum, which is A. Um, and you want to check where the, um, here we go, datum A, sorry. You want to check the flatness of datum A, because that's usually going to be your first challenging, challenging call out. Uh, but basically what we're saying is we're going to set this down on a surface plate or a very flat surface and to inspect it. And we need it to 20 thousandths of an inch here probably. Um, and then you go march through the datums after that. So interestingly, I was highlighting this one earlier. They're saying that this flange face here needs to be parallel within six thousandths to A. So something important is happening there. Uh, probably we're gonna set some sort of splined gear on this 
yeah, this is M42 thread. So yeah, some some gear is going to get spun down, or some object is going to get spun down and bear up against this surface. So then we're saying B here is datum two, and that's this center bore here is datum B, and this one wants to have a run out less than this diameter of that. Um, so we want this pretty straight, and that's in reference to A. And then C is our subdatum, which is this inside piece here. So presumably there's some stepped or shouldered things going through this way and some other things getting thread down here. So same thing here, another bolt circle call out, uh, which once again, is we're attempting to give the manufacturing process as much room as they can to re realistically assemble this. Um, and once again, it's worth just having a good stare at these and trying to back out what the engineer is attending while not listening to me blab on about it. So gd and t runs on two fundamental rules. Um, is that um, when you call out a feature size, it's uh, presumed to be maximum. Um, and it shouldn't be bigger than that. There is an LMC condition for holes and spaces um, that works as a functionally the sign inverse. Um, and then regardless of feature size is how we drop back to Cartesian classical coordinating, um, just to make sure we have a catch all in there. So we try and always run in the rule one, if not rule two catches you. Um, this is a basic control frame. Uh, I'm gonna go through this real quickly, just so that you have a way to sort of pick your way through the examples that follow just after this. So if you remember at the very beginning, we had a, kind of a lookup table that told you what the control was and whether it was form or tolerance or another type. Um, so in this case, this is a circularity uh, control. This is how much circularity we're allowing. And here's the datums we reference. Um, and you'll see every control frame has the same basic structure. Um, sometimes there's a couple of stacked control frames, which talk about either end of the maximum and minimum material conditions or that there's multiple types of geometric controls that apply to one thing. Um, so back here we have datums A, B, and C. Well, what do we mean about a datum? A datum is essentially a surface we're gonna put the thing that's being made against to measure it. Um, so in this example, uh, we have a part and it's gonna be set in the back corners of these planes, X, Y, and Z in this functional assembly. So datum A would be the first plane we set it down on. Um, and in this example, somewhat confusingly, we're calling it datum D. Um, and it should be flat within 12 thousandths. Um, and then datum E here is getting pushed against this back plane. And it should be square within 2 thousandths. And then datum F is on this far edge here, and it's getting pushed into this. And it should be square within two. So this one, this one, and this one, the next three slides are just practices. They're snapshots of various gd and prints that we found that have control frames. You can use the lookup table at the beginning or online references to start just looking through these and understanding what the designer is intending to communicate about the geometric shape and how these things should be made, particularly with an eye to all of these are functional in assembly. So the bolt patterns and the other references uh, are talking about how this might be assembled. Uh, if you want to know more, there's a huge Wikipedia page that opens up into a whole lot of, um, references. It's a deep dive. There's a lot of complexity in there, much like parametric modeling in the modern CAD environment. Um, it's a very easy hello world and pop-up start, but true mastery takes study and concentration. Uh, so I'd recommend uh, at least, you know, drive around, get familiar with the ground. Um, and then when you're challenged to need or use or understand this stuff, you'll have a, a good starting place to work from. Um, here's what the future is probably going to look like is we're going to have parametric modeling of a solid in a computer environment. And then there'll be an overlay you can toggle on and off that has the GDNT callouts. So you can see here, we're setting data may is this face. 
Um, and then we're moving on and making these call outs. So we have fundamental dimensions and control frames and so forth. That's all for the GDT lecture. Thank you very much.